Uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. This is our part three of three on psychedelic assisted therapies. And today specifically, we'll be speaking about psilocybin assisted therapy, looking at history, basic science, neurophysiology, clinical applications, and the overlap with spirituality, meditation, and transcendence. Um, if you are collecting your continuing medical education, um, you can use the activity code 11ACRE. We can put that also into the chat so people can see that. And um, you, if you're not using EADS, you can register for EADS on your phone and then enter 11 Acre. Um, but again, that will be available for you uh, during this presentation, but also after. If you have questions, you can email us so that we can help you with that. Let me see here. Uh, our mission for the Institute for Integrative Health and Wellness is to promote the health and healing of individuals, families, and communities we serve through the advancement of the practice of integrative health and the science upon which it is based and the education of healthcare practitioners and the USC community, as well as our surrounding communities. Our vision is to transform healthcare by establishing a collaborative, holistic paradigm that promotes health and healing and integrates all aspects of human life, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, cultural, social, and environmental. The USC Center for Mindfulness Science is a collaborative hub for interdisciplinary research into the nature and practice of mindfulness. And their aim is to use the tools of science and systematic inquiry to shed light on the, con the constituents of mindfulness and individual and interpersonal and social impacts of mindfulness practices. Uh, CMS aims to better understand how mindfulness and related contemplative practices affect our minds, our bodies, our social world with an eye towards building a more integrated, aware, and compassionate society. So as you can see, this is a collaborative between USC Centers for Mindfulness Science and USC um, Institute for Integrative Health and Wellness. It's important to acknowledge the land from which we live and we teach and we educate and we have experiences and we learn um, to understand and acknowledge the presence of the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. Um, and we recognize that these peoples were forcibly removed from their homelands. We take this opportunity to acknowledge the generations that have gone before us, as well as the present day Gabrielina Tongva people. With humility, we recognize and respect all indigenous peoples, their histories, and their ties to the land. We recognize other uh, traditional ancestral groups in these lands as are listed here. We pay respect to their past and their present. Let this acknowledgement serve as an ongoing reminder of the original inhabitants where we reside, where you reside. Uh, again, this is your uh, EADS for CME credit. Um, so you can actually use your phone and snap that QR code and go on and uh, again, up, upload your or download your EADS mobile app and enter that code to get your credit. I also wanna recognize the hardworking group executive steering committee and staff of the IIHW. They're all listed here. I'm very proud to work with many and all of them on the projects and the work that we do collectively. And I'm very uh, thankful for Dean Varun Sony, who's in the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, who support and, and is our home to the IIHW. I also wanna recognize directors and steering committee of the USC Center for Mindfulness Science, for which Dr. Rael Khan is director, along with Sean Roll and, and their steering committee. So again, many thanks for lots of people doing this very important work. Uh, today, I'll be introducing the pr three presenters and also I'll be uh, moderating the Q&A um, to be very respectful of our presenters so they can, they can impart to you what they have planned to share. Uh, we'll hold the, Q, the questions and answers to the end. You can type into the Q&A, and I will be managing those questions at the very end of their three presentations. Uh, IHW is having a symposium in July looking at virtual reality and healthcare, just to show you the depth <laughs> of which we operate as an integrative group, as well as CMS has a keynote presentation on mindfulness from MRI to mobile health 
with Kathleen Garrison, and that's was at was oh I'm oh, is April twenty sixth at noon. So just in six days. All right, thank you. I'm gonna stop that sharing. So I'll get the faces up here. Perfect. And with that, I will go about introducing our first presenter, uh, Dr. David Presti. Uh, he teaches biology, psychology, and cognitive science at the University of California, Berkeley, or as we like to say, Cal, where he has been on the faculty in molecular and cell biology for more than 30 years. For more than a decade, he worked in the clinical treatment of addiction and of post-traumatic stress disorder at the Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center in San Francisco. And for the past 20 years, he's been teaching neuroscience and conversing about science within the Tibetan Buddhist monoistics in India, Bhutan, and Nepal. He has his doctorates in molecular biology and biophysics from Caltech and in clinical psychology from the University of Oregon. So it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. David Presti as our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really a privilege to be part of this conversation. So thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, as, as stated, I'm a professor at, at, at UC Berkeley, uh, and uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that the campus of Berkeley and the city of Berkeley all sit on the unceded land of the ancestral inhabitants of this land, who some of which are still very much alive today. Uh, the uh, Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people. And uh, we, we are grateful and honor uh, being able to be hosted still on this land today and benefit from it in the ways that we have. Um, let me share my screen here and get started. Uh, okay. Okay, I assume someone will tell me if that's not working. Uh, so um, uh, my uh, my task here today is to provide a, a general background to psilocybin containing mushrooms and the molecule psilocybin and it, the related molecule psilocin uh, and uh, some of their basic properties in terms of chemistry and neurobiology. And I'm kind of here. Are, here is sort of the agenda I would like to get through in the next few minutes. Uh, first of all, a little bit about how amazing mushrooms and other fungi actually are, and something about the history of the human relationship uh, with these beings, and their global distribution and variety of the psilocybin-containing mushrooms, and how they entered into contemporary culture. Uh, the, the particular molecules, psilocybin and psilocin, that we hear about these days, and uh, a little bit of material related to that in terms of um, how we got that concept of molecules and, uh, and how we began to research psychedelically active molecules in the 20th century and then where we are today. And then I know that uh, uh, Dr. Grobe will take us into the the world of the clinical research and findings. So, first of all, you know the the excuse me, the amazingness of mushrooms uh, is manifest by mostly by what we don't see of these organisms. So, the mushrooms are just the as many of you I'm sure know are the fruiting bodies, the spore producing bodies of a vast underground network of mycelia, which is most of the bulk of the, of the fungus. And, and the mycelia are deeply interconnected with the, the microbial world of the soil, the root systems of trees uh, and other plants, the mycelial systems of other fungi. There's a vast symbiotic relationship that contemporary biological science is really only now appreciating in the last, say, one to two decades, how extensive this this world is of uh, of, uh, of fungal mycelia and how essential it is to the operation of life as we know it. <clears throat> we have within our bodies and on our bodies 
fun fungi living uh, that are in symbiotic relationship with our own physiology and the health and uh, non-health of those systems on our body, our microbiome very much are related to, you know, how our own health is manifest. So fungi has an interesting history because if you, you go back even a generation or two, <clears throat> fungi weren't appreciated by many people to be, excuse me, while I take a drink of water here. If, if we go back a few decades, in many people's view, uh, there it wasn't even appreciated that these were anything other than plants. And here's a book, a field guide, very popular field guide that some of you may have grown up with, uh, the Golden Guide series. And here the, the fungi are being called non-flowering plants, along with other things <clears throat> like ferns and so forth. And this was also an era where just a few years after that, there was actually a golden field guide, a kid's book on hallucinogenic plants uh, that featured uh, psil psil psilocybe mushrooms uh, as one of the things in the book. Now we appreciate that fungi uh, are a vast kingdom that older than the plants, older than the animals, and deeply symbiotic with all plants and animals insofar as we are able to investigate at this time. When it comes to the interaction of human cultures and mushrooms, we know that from, from various kinds of uh, iconography that the history goes back thousands of years. So for example, there are mushroom shaped stones that come from uh, Central America and South America that have been dated as old as 2,000 years from parts of Guatemala and so forth. Uh, there are there are examples of rock art from around the world, uh, the oldest ones being from southern Spain and from northern Africa, which have been dated from six to 9,000 years old and appear to depict things that look like mushrooms. Now, we don't know anything about the medicinal activity of these mushrooms or whether they were psychoactive or not, but it does suggest that uh, they were revered enough among peoples of those times to be represented in the rock art, whereas you know many things were not represented in rock art. If you look at even older rock art from East Africa and from far northwestern Australia, some of those um, those uh, uh, rock arts have been dated by, as potentially more than ten to twelve thousand years old, and they have things that kind of look mushroomy. Uh, drawn among them. So there are suggestions of long human relationship with mushrooms and speculations of, of that relationship with humanity going way further than that uh, back in time. Uh, this is a somewhat famous drawing by the visionary artist Alex Gray from a number of years ago, uh, which is his way of representing what has come to be called the stoned ape theory, that maybe ancient hominin ancestors ingested psychoactive mushrooms. And because of the sorts of visionary experiences that may be occasioned by that, that may have catalyzed uh, reconfiguring neural processes in some way as to actually expand upon the cognitive function of, of the human brain and mind uh, in a way that maybe uh, not only develop various aspects of higher so-called higher cognition, but also things like language um, and, uh, and, and relationship with uh, kind of a spiritual world and, and so forth. Uh, so, and the, the reason this kind of theory makes uh, a lot of sense in a way is because Psilocybin containing mushrooms, that is the potent psychedelically active mushrooms, are found all over the planet. Uh, this is a, a map that dates from 25 years ago, really, uh, put together by a scholar of psilocybe mushrooms in, uh, in Mexico, Guzman, who's now deceased. Uh, and at that time, uh, he had noted the locations of roughly you know, a hundred different places or so around the planet, and many, 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 you know, around that same number of different species here. 
I know that there are more sites that are not marked on this map that in, including southern China uh, that have since been found to uh, have what appear to be indigenous uh, species of psychedelically active mushrooms as part of their local uh, uh, biosphere. Uh, so the, the fact that they're found so pervasively all around the planet, wherever folks have looked for them, uh, makes it hard to believe that, that uh, humans who inhabited these various places wouldn't have like munched on a few of these things and experienced in some manner uh, their visionary properties. Uh, there are over 100 species, as I mentioned. Here are some close-up pictures of several that are that grow in this area. Uh, this is uh, this is Psilocybe cubensis, the most famous one that has is widely cultivated. It's not; it may not be indigenous to where I am right now in Northern California, but uh, uh, it, it was actually first found in Cuba. That's why it's called cubensis at the beginning of the 20th century and identified there. Uh, and uh, it has been found in a number of places in Asia and so forth. But because it is widely cultivated. Uh, the, it could have spread around by that kind of human dissemination. Uh, this is um, Psilocybe semilanciata, or the Liberty Cap mushroom, which grows in the, abundantly in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and uh, Psilocybe cyanescens, which grows on the UC Berkeley campus, among other places. Uh, and uh, a relatively new species, Psilocybe alani. Uh, so, all over the world, uh, and but in terms of written history, written history is very much more recent. And the oldest text that may have been describing something that may have been a psychoactive mushroom is the Rig Veda, which is an ancient Vedic text in their very early days of Hinduism or even pre-Hinduism text of hymns and prayers you know more than 3000 years old and uh, there's a there's a, a substance a, uh, a living material of some kind called soma soma which is mentioned in there and the identity of soma is is debated uh, nobody knows what it is it appears not to be a plant because of the descriptions that were given not having leaves and so forth uh, uh, something that may have been a phedra, a leafless plant, and others think it may have been some kind of mushroom and may have well been a psilocybe mushroom. Uh, they grow uh, all over Asia, uh, so um, who knows? But the oldest evidence for actual use of what we now understand to be the psychedelic psilocybe mushroom uh, comes from uh, the, the texts of Spanish uh, missionaries that came along with the conquest of Mexico uh, in uh, in the 1500s and documented the traditional uses of, of the tr traditional ceremonial practices of the people uh, that had been living there, uh, the, the folks that we now call the Maya, the Aztec, and, and so forth. Um, and they talked about a a mushroom, something that, that was clearly a mushroom uh, in their language called teonanacatl, uh, which literally translates as flesh of the gods. Uh, and this was written up and illustrated quite extensively by various folks uh, in the 1500s. Those, some of those manuscripts are still preserved today. Uh, the most famous one is called the Florentine Codex. It's in uh, the Laurentian Library in Florence, Italy, uh, and uh, uh, is uh, extensively illustrated and documents uh, the use, the ceremonial use of these materials. Uh, okay. So these indigenous practices, first documented in writing 500 years ago, likely go back millennia. Uh, and are only known, as I mentioned, with any kind of definitiveness from uh, the, the, the Mesoamerica. Uh, and in the about you know close to 100 years ago now, uh, the famous pioneer 
uh, American ethnobotanist Richard Evans Schultes, when he was a graduate student at Harvard in the 1930s, uh, got very interested in these the possibility that there was the uh, the uh, use of a mushroom in some ceremonial or medicinal healing manner uh, by by uh, peoples in Mexico at that time, uh, and uh, got hold of uh, copies of the of the, the the text from the 1500s that at that point had not been translated into English. So he read them in French translation because he didn't speak fluent Spanish at that time. He later developed that fluency. Uh, and uh, and so in the late 1930s, 1938, 1939, Schultes took two trips to Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, and ended up in the village of Huatla de Jimenez, uh, trying to locate any evidence for the, the contemporary use of psychoactive mushrooms. Uh, he was not, he was, he got some samples of mushrooms, which he had ten tentatively identified, but he was not able to uh, connect with any people that uh, were, were practitioners with these materials. Uh, he came back to Harvard, he wrote it up as part of his dissertation. It was published in the, 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 uh, the journals of the Harvard Botanical Museum, so kind of a obscure place. And, uh, and then uh, if, if World War II hadn't been about to happen, he probably would have gone back and sort of pinned down the usage a little bit more uh, precisely at that time. But World War II was was about to break out, and and Schultes really wanted to go to the Amazon to study the ethnobotany of Amazonian plants, and so he figured he better get there before the war started. So he went to South America, and proceeded to spend the next five years there, or really the next twenty years there, uh, but pretty much full time for the next five years. And uh, so that work kind of got forgotten until it was rediscovered in the early nineteen fifties by Gordon and Valentina Watson, who were a couple from New York City that were enthusiasts uh, uh, for uh, mushrooms and human relationships with mushrooms of various kinds, medicinal, culinary, potentially psychoactive, and, and so forth. Uh, and they connected with Schultes, got his papers, and they, they decided they would follow up. They went down to Oaxaca, to the same village, uh, and the uh, kind of the rest is history in a way, which I'll briefly go over. So uh, the Wassons ended up in the well. This is a picture of of Schultes on the on the left when he was an undergraduate at Harvard, uh, and at this point he was investigating peyote and the peyote ceremony uh, in in collaboration with uh, peoples who were using it ceremonially in Oklahoma and an anthropologist, Weston LaBerre, who was uh, trying to document the, the indigenous ceremonial use of, of the peyote cactus. Uh, and so Wasson uh, and his wife, Valentina, made several trips to, to uh, Oaxaca uh, and eventually uh, connected with a medicine woman, Maria Sabina, who agreed to actually give Wasson, Gordon Wasson, first a, a ceremonial experience with these mushrooms. So that was a huge, huge decision on her part. Uh, and uh, she, was a, she was a healer. She was highly respected in her community, although folks who worked with those spirit beings, the mushrooms, uh, they had a very, their, their status in society was also often very liminal because they were working with powerful forces. So it's, it's very complicated. Uh, um, all that was going on there. In any case, though, she made the decision to uh, ceremonially introduce these mushrooms to Wasson, <clears throat> knowing that he was going to talk about it. He was going to, you know, reveal this in some way to the world. He he did it in a way that uh, it, at at first was anonymous. You know, there was no identification of Maria Sabina by name or by geographic location, but people were very quickly able to find out uh, where he was talking about. But the the article that Wasson wrote was appeared in Life magazine in May of 1957. Uh, and uh, the discovery of mushrooms that cause strange visions, seeking the magic mushroom. That's quite a catchy title. This magazine 
uh, uh, at the time had tens of millions of readers. It was, you know, very, very popular. Uh, and uh, so a lot of folks learned about these materials through reading this magazine. Uh, uh, here's a picture of uh, from uh, that article from of Wasson and his wife Valentina, who was a pediatrician, uh, and 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 originally from Russia, uh, so grew up in a world of appreciation of the culinary and medicinal value of mushrooms. Uh, and she herself, in a lesser known article, but perhaps more widely read even than the Life magazine one, wrote an article the following week that appeared in a in a newspaper-like insert that would show up in the, the Sunday newspapers of hundreds of different newspaper outlets <clears throat> around the United States. So again, well over 10 million people were introduced to uh, the the mushroom by way of Valentina Wasson's article, which was called "I Ate the Sacred Mushrooms." Uh, again, you know, very uh, provocative or evocative uh, title. Uh, so, in any case, you know, the word was out, uh, and uh, Maria Sabina, who had been uh, uh, completely unknown outside of her village and the local environment. Uh, until that all happened, uh, eventually her town became a, a real focus of, of tourist travel. Uh, it became a very difficult scene. Uh, the town, which had been very hard to reach in those days and very quiet and undisturbed, uh, really became a kind of tourist des destination as it was at that time <clears throat> for seekers of psychedelic experience and altered consciousness and so forth. And so uh, it, it was a very uh, fraught situation in many ways. These are pictures from the Life magazine article that show Maria Sabina uh, in the midst of a ceremony where one of her young children is right next to her and, and the picture on the left. So a few years later in 1970, so now we're 13 years after the Life and This Week magazine articles, Gordon Wasson has a a really nice uh, one one page uh, kind of opinion piece in in the New York Times where he talks about the problems that ensued for Maria Sabina for her town after that uh, and his own like uh, uh, feeling somewhat responsible you know for all of that coming down uh, and yet feeling like this was important information for the world as well and, and interestingly. Uh, Maria Sabina and in interviews that she granted in the mid 1970s to one of her contemporary uh, Mazatec speakers, I mean, Mazatec, uh, Mazatec language speakers uh, that were then translated into Spanish and English, uh, said herself that she herself was conflicted. Uh, on one hand, she said the the sacred mushrooms have really been degraded and have lost their power as a result of sort of giving away. You know, making this uh, this powerful material somehow a source of more public knowledge and awareness, and attracting a, a tourist population and so forth. And on the other hand, she also said that she felt it was the right thing to do uh, that this uh, information be shared. So a complicated thing. So there's a great movie uh, called. Uh, Maria Sabina Mujer Espiritu, Spirit Woman, uh, that is uh, you, is freely available on YouTube. Uh, and it uh, was a documentary made about Maria Sabina when she was still alive. And one of the most beautiful things are her songs. You know, she sang during the, during the ceremony of the use of psilocybe mushrooms uh, as it is practiced uh, by the Mazatec of, of the Sierra Mazateca in, in, in Oaxaca. Uh, is to sing almost continuously, and the songs are prayers uh, during during the journey. Uh, so she's monitoring the the healer, uh, the, uh, the medicine person is monitoring the kind of psychic state of of whoever is there with her, and and tuning her prayers to that. Uh, and so she was really a beautiful poet in her own language with many, many beautiful songs. And some of these, some of these were recorded 
uh, by the Wassons, and uh, and uh, many of them are actual part of the soundtrack uh, of this movie. Highly recommended. So let's talk about the molecule psilocybin and the related material psilocin. So where these these were discovered in 1958 by <clears throat> Albert Hoffman, uh, the same. Swiss chemist who in 1943, uh, just uh, 80 years ago yesterday, on April 19th, 1943, uh, established the powerful psychedelic effects, psych psychoactively psychedelic effects of LSD, a molecule that he had synthesized. Uh, so the LSD experience for Hoffman changed his life in such a way that he felt like this was one of the more important things that he could devote his chemical expertise to, to studying the occurrence of such of related things in nature. And so uh, the Wassons were able to, through in collaboration with a French mycologist, uh, Roger Heim, uh, were able to get samples of, of uh, the mushrooms from Mexico to Albert Hoffman. And then Hoffman chemically extracted uh, the various components of these mushrooms and was able to identify two that were powerfully psychoactive uh, in a way that is was somewhat reminiscent of LSD, but, but much less potent, uh, psilocybin and psilocin. And, and as with LSD, he discovered the psychoactive effects by consuming it himself. Uh, the same was true with uh, with uh, uh, the mushrooms. So the psychoactive effects are uh, they last uh, five hours or so. You know, there's about a one percent. Uh, uh, there's about a there's about ten milligrams of of uh, of psilocybin per gram of mushroom, uh, and psilocybin would not cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, and so it is uh, uh, the the fact that it's psychoactive because of that phosphate group, which has a lot of charge and polarity to it. Uh, the uh, but uh, it psilocybin is very quickly, once it enters the body, converted to psilocin, and the psilocin does uh, cross the blood brain barrier. So the actual active molecule that's doing everything in our nervous system, uh, and elsewhere in our body, perhaps, is psilocin, not psilocybin. Uh, but the two words are often, uh, the two terms are often used interchangeably, um, and the conversion happens very rapidly. And it doesn't even have to be orally eaten. If psilocybin is injected into the bloodstream intravenously, uh, within a minute, it's all gone. It's all converted into psilocin. Uh, so the uh, the psilocin, though, is only found in trace amounts in the mushroom because the psilocybin, uh, because the psilocin is very unstable in the presence of oxygen. And uh, psilocybin, however, is very stable in the presence of oxygen, so can last for decades, actually, uh, and if it's, if it's uh, well packaged on the shelf. But psil psilocin would break down relatively quickly, and it actually forms uh, polymers uh, that are blue in color. And so hence the bluing reaction of mushrooms that have been bruised, that, uh, that the, the bruising of the mushroom activates an enzyme that converts the psilocybin to the psilocin and, and then it polymerizes to form uh, blue things. I wanna make one important point here, uh, and that is the profound reduction that we have made in contemporary science from an organism, in this case, a mushroom, to a molecule. And we kind of do this routinely, but this is in, an incredibly profound thing. So rather than talking about the healing capabilities of the entire mushroom and the set and setting and ceremonial use of it, we tend to focus on psilocybin or psilocin. Uh, and really this is, uh, this is reflection. This is a reflection of very different worldviews, very different cosmologies, you know, very different, uh, definitions of what we consider to be real. Uh, we consider to be real the, uh, the, the molecules, the atoms, the molecules, the matter. Uh, that's our notion of what reality is. And in the worldviews of traditions that hold the sacred use of materials like mushrooms and, and, and uh, psychedelically active plants like 
like uh, peyote or uh, or iboga or the components of ayahuasca and so forth, uh, there's a very different worldview in that what is real is the being, the 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 being of the plant as a as a sentient being, just as we humans are in relationship uh, that has the capacity to be a teacher, uh, to be um, to be an ally. Uh, and and so forth. And so, but there's a lot of confusion with this in the way folks talk about this. Uh, I hear people say all the time, you know, the indigenous use of psilocybin. Well, there is no indigenous use of psilocybin. There's an indigenous use of psilocybin containing mushrooms. Or people talk about the FDA approval of mushrooms. Uh, the FDA does not approve mushrooms. It approves molecules, you know, psilocybin. Or what's happening in Oregon right now? People talk about the the psilocybin uh, initiative there, but it really is it's the psilocybin containing mushroom initiative. That's what the the therapeutic work is being done with. So this profound reduction has been applied throughout, of course, all of natural products chemistry. So we think about everything uh, that all of these plants that have long histories of sacred ceremonial use uh, and are held in very different ways by the cultures that use them as uh, as actual beings with, with whom one is in relationship with. Uh, we think of them simply as molecules that we can kind of control in some way uh, and then ingest and experience certain kinds of effects. Now, I'm getting messages that say I, I should stop. So let's see here, where would be a good place to stop? Okay, you want to hear something about the neurobiology, I assume. So let me let me just say this: uh, you know, psilocybin and psilocin are classical psychedelics, and psilocybin and psilocin are are classical psychedelics. And all of the classical psychedelics, you know, have a main effect that has been identified in the nervous system of being agonists or activators of serotonin 2A receptors. Serotonin 2A receptors are, are um, GPCRs. They're G-protein coupled receptors, which means when those receptors are activated, a whole cascade of complicated stuff can happen. Uh, including immediate effects on excitation or inhibition of the neuron, but also longer term effects like in, induction of the of nerve growth factors, which would uh, manifest uh, aspects of neuroplasticity and so forth. So one can have both short term and long term changes, which are presumably important. I think one of the most interesting discoveries that has happened in contemporary neuroscience of psychedelics was just published a couple of months ago. Uh, and it establish it seems to establish, and of course this will need replication and expansion upon it, uh, that that the actual site of binding of the serotonin that is activating a neuroplastic effect in uh, uh, in the neurons in the brain uh, is intracellular. Uh, and it makes complete sense that that might be possible. I've, in fact, I've always wondered by pretty much all why it is that all of pharmacology uh, focuses on uh, surface receptors of plasma membranes. Uh, so all of psychopharmacology, that's what we talk about. Uh, and, and yet uh, anything that's getting into the brain, any drug that's getting into the brain is also it's doing so because it can diffuse across the lipid bilayer membranes that form the blood brain barrier. And if it can get into the brain, that means it can get inside the neuron. So all psychoactive drugs are able to enter neurons directly. Uh, and so why wouldn't there be potentially active sites inside a neuron? And these folks actually look for that. Uh, and found, sure enough, uh, that it seemed to be the site of significance for induction of dendritic growth uh, in, in CNS neurons is actually intracellular 5-HT2A receptors. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we don't know what this will lead to, but it's pretty cool. So 
one final word then, and then I'll shut up for a while. Uh, the the neurobiological, the fact that the brain is complicated and we can only say limited things about it right now in terms of detailed mechanistic understanding of how things are working. Uh, but any kind of image of something going on in the brain or that can be conveyed really within the worldview that we hold strongly suggests that there are real physical changes happening in our brain and that we're likely to use this in a way that contributes to therapeutic efficacy. That is certainly likely to be a primary mechanism of so-called placebo effects in psychiatric medications, for example. If we believe something is working because we have a narrative of a certain mechanism, it will contribute uh, to its therapeutic efficacy. And that can be operating at every level, uh, including with psychedelics. Uh, and so I, I like to, in following Stan Groff, I like to think of one component of psychedelic effects as a sort of activation of what Groff called uh, holotropism. That is a movement toward wholeness, a activation of an inner healing intelligence, a capacity to, to move to heal toward healing, that we know how to do that in some intrinsic way, and that these materials and these contexts in which they're used may facilitate that in, one, in some way or another. So how about I stop there for now? Thank exactly. you so much. No, that was that was brilliant and always fascinating to learn about the history. Um, I think it gives people context. And so we really appreciate that. I wish we had more time, but we don't. Um, so, but thank you very much. Look forward to the Q&A with you. You can actually turn off your camera because Ryle's going to take over the stage now. That's perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So this is, next presenter is Dr. Ryle Khan a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at USC and directs the USC Center for Mindfulness Science, as well as his lab at the USC Brain and Creativity Institute. He's been involved in brain studies of meditation and psychedelics for the last 20 years. Broadly, his lab is focused on the neurophysiologic changes underlying clinical efficacy of meditation and mindfulness and psychedelic assisted therapies for depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders. His current research is focused on the brain changes associated with altered self-experience and the relationship to the thinking process in experienced uh, meditators, and is also studying the epigenetic basis to MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD in a collaboration with the MAPS Phase Three clinical trial. So it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Rael Khan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to keep my presentation a little sh uh, on the uh, short end because I really want to make sure to give uh, adequate time or at least close to adequate time to gain uh, the wisdom of our two guest speakers who are here with us today, Dr. Presti and Dr. Grove. Um, I'll start sharing my screen though for basically a kind of highlight of some of the studies I've done comparing and contrasting the effects of psilocybin and um, long-term uh, practice of meditation. So, uh, Jeff, please let me know if my screen is not sharing, but I think it is. Um, great. So I'm going to be sharing some slides about EEG studies, electroencephalograph electroencephalography studies, uh, in both long-term vipassana or mindfulness meditators, comparing meditation, state of meditation to thinking as well as uh, the effects of psilocybin versus placebo. Basically, these are studies measuring the electrical activity of the brain as it processes the sensory world under the influence of consciousness altering practices. And I really appreciate uh, 
uh, David's last words about not mistaking the map for the territory with regards to brain imaging. Um, and I'll say just at the outset that um, while I think there are some very interesting insights into how these consciousness altering practices and substances uh, affect brain processes and what that implies about how uh, the brain works generally and altered states of consciousness are mediated partly through brain. It's also the case that despite many years of study, uh, neither meditation nor psychedelics show a specific highly correlated brain change that's associated with the really interesting uh, alteration in consciousness, whether, whether that be the more simple aspects where we do have some you know, correlations for all the different domains, but the simple aspects of just visual hallucination or visual alterations, or the more complex multifactorial aspects of a full-blown mystical experience, which tends to drive a lot of the interest in this, uh, these kinds of substances, psilocybin and other psychedelics. And that the driver of that uh, interest being related to the mystical state, I think both has uh, you know, foundations in our human experience of being alive and that dramatic impact of feeling the merge of the inner world with the outer world, that dropping away of the boundary between the self and the observed, uh, the self and the other, and the experience of the wholeness, such a deeply felt uh, uh, meaningful experience that has really organized human societies. And, um, and it turns out seems to be at least statistically significantly correlated with their clinical efficacy in the more recent uh, you know, emergence of clinical trials. Um, but that state also, you know, no really significant, uh, highly replicable correlation, despite the many different changes in brain activity that we see, um, it's just there's so much variety to how each individual person's brain uh, constitutes their lived experience in the world they inhabit. So I think we're never going to have some key to that state of consciousness or to understanding consciousness alterations generally uh, by understanding a one-to-one -one, uh, correlation because each of our brains are so different. And I think that's just an important kind of uh, take home message I'd like to give as a neuroscientist who's been studying these things for 20 years now. Um, but this uh, couple of slides is about using a, a cognitive science paradigm, the oddball paradigm, to elicit brain activity and look at what aspects of brain activity are shifted either as a result of meditation or psychedelics and where there may be commonalities and similarity uh, and, and differences. Um, so this is a schematic representation of an oddball paradigm where a series of standards or beeps are uh, presented to the uh, participant with an occasional oddball sound, a boop. Um, so here's something like beep, 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 boop, beep, 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 and eh. And the ant eh being like a distractor sound that really tends to grab the attention involuntarily. And so the brain, when hearing a series of sounds like this, becomes habituated to the standards and gives more importance and frontal you know, reactivity uh, to the oddballs and the distractors that involuntarily engage attention. And one interesting thing um, in meditation is there's a, a, a pattern, which then I uh, see also reproduced in looking at the effects uh, related to psilocybin. And that pattern is, an enhancement of the early sensory processing, the so-called bottom-up processing that does not rely as much on the top-down projections of the attentional system uh, seeking to find meaning in the world, but is more related to, although still related to top-down kind of amplification, more related to the bottom-up encoding in that first 100 milliseconds in the, in the brain. So an increase in meditation of the uh, early sensory encoding and a later decrease of automated reactivity 
when comparing meditation to uh, mind wandering or everyday thinking in long-term practitioners. So this seems to index something about the, the brain state underlying uh, meditation in, in folks who really have practiced meditation, that it's possible to tune the brain to be more uh, engaged with the sensory world and encoding the sensory world with sensitivity without so much reactivity uh, related to that uh, practicing of uh, equanimity. And um, similarly, when using a similar kind of paradigm with uh, standards and oddballs uh, in a visual domain uh, uh, and assessing the impact uh, of psilocybin on brain processing of these stimuli. So regular small circles with occasional even smaller circles and occasional black and white checkerboard that really engage this kind of uh, conflict detection, you know, a, a violation of the habituated uh, expectation. Um, you see a similar uh, overall pattern with uh, in, in the top row placebo, top uh, middle row low dose and lower row high dose, um, this early sensory encoding activity uh, referred to as a P100 response is enhanced um, in the psilocybin conditions, but the later uh, frontal reactivity to the stimuli is decreased comparing the darker red, you know, placebo responding to the low dose and high dose where the, the amplitude of that responding goes down. So I'm gonna uh, try to keep my, uh, my commentary short on this, as I mentioned, so just, a couple, just skipping those couple of slides, I just wanna leave with this um, kind of summary uh, slide showing that on one level, there's a similarity, and I, I'm going to point out both a similarity and a difference here. So you can see the um, uh, on the left, the auditory oddball and auditory distractor responding in the so-called auditory uh, P300 uh, or oddball uh, paradigm in long-term meditators, that there's evidence in meditation of an enhanced early sensory representation concurrently with a decreased later frontal reactivity. And similarly, comparing the effect of psilocybin to a placebo-containing pill, uh, you know, an enhancement on the right side there of the visual oddball and visual distractor, the amplitude of the sensory encoding or the more bottom-up aspect of processing is enhanced, and the uh, amplitude of the later cognitive evaluation and attentional engagement is reduced by psilocybin. Now, the, um, the important uh, thing to mention here is that these uh, effects are quite revert reversible in the meditator's brain. In other words, when you uh, ask the meditator to attend purposefully to the stimuli, instead of seeing this re reduction of the later cognitive engagement that happens while they are meditating and ignoring the stimuli, you see that in general, the brain resources are even more available to engage with the sensory world than in the non-meditator. The non There's a whole line of evidence, some of which I've done and much of which others have, have done, showing that this, uh, essentially one aspect of engaging in meditation uh, longitudinally over time is an enhancement of the the brain's attentional resources. Um, so this this uh, reduction of later cognitive attentional engagement is not an obligatory uh, aspect of meditation, but more a state effect. When meditating and attempting to tune the external world out, then you successfully are able to do that. When attending with as much attention as possible to the external world, then you see an actual increase in the, the brain's attentional engagement. In contrast, the effect with psilocybin demonstrated here is an involuntary effect. The uh, participants were doing their best to engage with the stimuli and the brain just wouldn't let them <laughs> fully engage in the attentional way uh, with this kind of frontal attentional engagement, a marker of the degree to which um, incoming stimuli are being fully uh, 
uh, incorporated in working memory and expectation uh, kind of uh, of what's coming next moment to moment. So uh, this state that psilocybin is putting people in uh, at a brain physiology level is kind of like an involuntarily meditating state as opposed to an increase in attentional flexibility that you see in long-term meditators. And I think this may also relate to why, in some cases, you know, these kinds of substances can be uh, harmful to uh, one's experience. So one really does have to be careful about how one uses these substances as you go into this bottom-up processing state with less capacity to make uh, expected meanings uh, out of the sensory world. Um, you know, you become uh, a, a, a little more uh, vulnerable to the conditions and um, intentions of the, of the world around you. Um, so it's just especially important to use these in therapeutic ways. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that and uh, pass along the baton to Dr. Grove. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Khan. That was a wonderful background on some of the psychophysiology and brain studies in this area. So we appreciate that. It's giving people, again, context to better understand the effects and usages of psilocybin. Um, so we will move on now into our third and final presenter before we then <clears throat> move into our Q&A. So feel free, again, uh, listening members of our community to uh, populate any questions you have into our Q&A section, and then we will tackle those at the completion of Dr. Grubb's presentation. So um, it's my honor to introduce the third and final presenter, Dr. Charles Grobe, a professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the UCLA School of Medicine and the director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the Harbor UCLA Medical Center. He has conducted clinical research with psychedelics since the early 1900s, from 2004 to 2008, he was the, the PI or principal investigator for the first study in several decades to examine the use of psilocybin treatment model for patients with advanced cancer anxiety. He has also conducted research into a range of effects of MDMA in both normal volunteers and in the selected subject population of adults with autism and with severe social anxiety. He has also conducted a series of I, won't, I don't know if I'm going to say this correctly, ayahuasca, sorry, ayahuasca research studies in Brazil. Over the last 30 years, Dr. Grove has published numerous articles and chapters on the psychedelics in the medical and the psychiatric literatures, and he is founding board member of the Hefter Research Institute. Right. So my pleasure, I'm going to dip out and then you can also um, po uh, post up your slides. Right. Thank you. Let, Thank let you. Me, um, sh share the screen. Okay, great. Perfect. So, um, yeah, so th thank you for inviting me to speak on this, uh, I, I think, fascinating topic, which I've been uh, re re really um, in in involved with on a number of levels for s several decades. Um, I will, in the interest of time, I'll try to be succinct. I may skip over some slides if they appear redundant from the other talks, but uh, let, let, let's get on with this. So um, psychedelics for human suffering, kind of generalize. Do we have a new paradigm, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis psychiatry uh, for, for the new century? And that, that's really the question at hand. Uh, the, the obligatory financial disclosures all these uh, have supported research and um so we we we, we know that um in our country we have in, increasing degrees of uh of uh, mental health disturbance of suicide gro growing rates of um uh suicide ma major depression treatment resistant depression and we have an escalating um I can see my slide. Es escalating um, uh, uh, expenditures to try to contain the, the, the you know the the, the surging rates of, uh, of of mental disturbance. So um, 
and we've kind of gotten to the point where in, in spite of escalating uh, out, outlay of uh, expenditure and services, uh, we seem to be falling behind and um, ha have uh, great difficulty stay staying abreast of the rising tide of uh, mental disturbance. So are, are, are we at that point where we might consider that we are, we, we are in need of a paradigm shift? The concept of a paradigm shift was first uh, explicated by the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn. Um, uh, in the early 1970s, a paradigm shift uh, is defined as a radical change in underlying beliefs or theories. And uh, a, a generally an important change that happens it occurs when the usual way of thinking about something or doing something is replaced by an entirely new and different way. So when it comes to uh, uh, conceptualizing uh, various uh, psychiatric disturbance and, and intervening, are, are, are we ready to, um, to, to, to you know, really consider a, a full on paradigm shift? And I, I will get back to kind of more detail late, later in the talk with that. Uh, what that might mean. So I, I always find the nomenclature of these compounds of, of great interest. Um, psychedelic, the, 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 the popular term in the culture coming from the 60s, it really arose out of a, a, a dialogue between Aldous Huxley, you know, the great British uh, uh, literary figure, and Humphrey Osmond, a very prominent uh, British Canadian uh, uh, psychiatrist specialized in the treatment of al alcohol. Uh, use disorder. They would. They had a correspondence going, and were trying to come up with a the ideal term for these unusual compounds. And Huxley suggested uh, in in verse uh, 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 to to um, <laughs> I'm having a block here uh, to make this trivial world sublime. Take half a gram of phenarothine, one one of the old suggested terms, and. Um, uh, Osmond responded, yet to fathom hell or soar angelic, take take a pinch of psychedelic. And so the term psychedelic was born. But you know, one concern about psychedelic is that it's too, to too great a degree associated with the, uh, the cultural phenomena of the 60s and early 70s. And theogen suggested by Houston Smith, generally referring to plant uh, compounds that contain uh, these uh, unusual alkaloids, and uh, but and they they achieve a, a kind of can facilitate a, a psycho spiritual epiphany, but not 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 all psychedelics do this, and not not and it's not a reliable uh, feature. So so then the the more traditional term was hallucinogen, which often gets uh, criticized because it's perceived as pathologizing these compounds. But if, uh, as my old friend Ralph Metzner kind of shared with me, if you look at the Latin root, root of the term hallucinogen, you see it comes from the Latin hallucinari, which means mind wandering, mind journeying, mind traveling, or, or, or tripping, as you were. And, I, and I, I've also felt in the medical context, um, uh, hallucinogen is the uh, proper term. But there's a host of alternative uh, terms, uh, del deliriance, uh, mystico mimetics, uh, uh, fantasticants, uh, a term of Louis Lewins, the uh, famous uh, German uh, psychopharmacologist from early in the last century, uh, psychotomimetics because of its uh, early, uh, the early belief that they, th these compounds might replicate uh, uh, psychotic experience, la la later debunked to some degree. So, uh, so he, he, these are generally the options one has. Uh, and in, in a book I, I recently uh, published, uh, uh, which I believe is the first formal textbook of these compounds, uh, which I uh, co-edited with Jim Grigsby at the University of Colorado, we settled on the term hallucinogen as being more appropriate in a professional, particularly a medical professional context. This is published by Guilford Press, by the way. So uh, I think I probably, uh, well, David had already uh, described how the 5-HT2A uh, receptor is, um, is the primary point of, uh, of agonism with, uh, with the classical psych psychedelics. And you can see that their chemical structure is very, very close to the, uh, 
the, the endogenous neurotransmitter serotonin. So it's, it's very peculiar that these same um, compounds uh, that grow uh, f f from, from the earth and which are have psychedelic alkaloids in them are very, very close to uh, serotonin. Serotonin, you know, 5-hydroxytryptamine, uh, psilocybin, 4-phosphoroxy, and then dimethyltryptamine. They all have this six-sided benzene ring and a five-sided pyrrole ring with a nitrogen uh, in it, uh, which are generally commonplace with the classical hallucinogens. Uh, some non-classic uh, hallucinogens, uh, NBOM active on a, a microgram level, it's a 5-HT2A and 2C agonist, but uh, ha it has been substituted for LSD and blotter. And when we talk with our patients, particularly our younger patients who may be interested in experimenting with, uh, with LSD, we have to caution them that not, not all blotter is, uh, that is sold as LSD is LSD. NBOM has been a substitute and has been um, held responsible for a number of, uh, of, of fatalities, which were presumed to be caused by LSD, but it was not LSD, it was NBOM. And Dave Nichols, a, uh, a very prominent medicinal chemist versus Purdue, another of the University of North Carolina, we wrote an article in the forensics literature a few years ago, kind of, you, you know, Kind of, kind of clarifying this issue. Salvinorm A is the isolated diterpene uh, from um, the plant uh, Sylvia divinorum, which is used for medicinal and spiritual uh, purposes and uh, amongst various indigenous groups and in, in, uh, in among the Mazatec Indians of Mexico. Um, the uh, active uh, diterpene uh, Salvinorm A uh, can cause a very, very short acting, but very, very bizarre dissociative experience. And, and I have yet to, to interview anyone who has uh, found this to be a drug of choice or has taken it more than once or twice. It could be a very uh, disturbing experience. Ketamine, we know a, gr a good deal about as we do with MDMA. Both have been applied in uh, clinical settings. And I began also a, uh, the isolated, um, alkaloid from the evoca plant from west africa from gabon where it's used in, as a sacrament and syncretic religion um the uh ibogaine alkaloid has been used uh, to treat uh, addiction it's considered to have some potential as an addiction interrupter it also has some cardiotoxicity so uh, one needs to proceed with some caution um, many of the uh, hallucinogens we're familiar with have their origins in plant form. David talked about psilocybin cubensis, uh, which contains psilocybin and psilocin, and psilocybin is broken down to psilocin upon ingestion. Lofophora williamsi is uh, uh, a um, uh, is peyote, uh, and from which mescaline was first uh, isolated and identified. And actually, the um, the, the the chemist the investigator who first d discovered mescaline from peyote was arthur hefter after whom the hefter research institute is named um uh, lewin had isolated uh, lewis lewin had isolated a, a number of alkaloids from peyote but in the animal experimentation could not determine which was the active psychoactive alkaloid and he left it up to his colleague hefter who decided to uh, sequentially, methodically ingest himself each each of the alkaloids on separate occasion, uh, by which he he uh, in the late uh, 1890s discovered uh, discovered mescaline. Claviceps purpura is a uh, is is a, an ergot fungus that grows on rye that is uh, believed to be uh, uh, part of the. Uh, beverage administered at the, at the ancient Greek rites of Eleusis, the Kikikion, uh, which contains lysergamides, not that dissimilar from uh, lysergic acid diethylamide, or, or LSD. Uh, ayahuasca, I, I've spent an appreciable amount of time studying uh, the range of effects of ayahuasca in Brazil. We did a number of, of field studies. Uh, ayahuasca itself is a decoction of two plants, each of which, when ingested by them on their, their own do, does nothing because they the active alkaloids are degraded by the monoamine oxidase uh, enzyme system 
but uh, when uh, when brewed together, when one in a rather complex multi-hour process, the bark of the Batisteriopsis vine and the leaf of Psychotria, uh, the, the Psychotria contains a powerful hallucinogen DMT, inactive when taken by itself orally, but when taken with Batisterius that Batisteriopsis copy, which, which contains harmala alkaloids, harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine, uh, which have monoamine oxidase inhibiting action, it uh, shuts down the monoamine oxidase system and allows for absorption of the uh, DMT and the psychotria and, and subsequent act, a central nervous system activation. This is a fascinating uh, plant decoction, and uh, I studied within the context of a syncretic church which had permission from the government uh, of Brazil to use it for religious purposes. And subsequently, there was a, a big federal case in the United States that I was involved with as an expert witness that actually um, went, went, was ruled favorably by a uh, federal judge uh, to protect freedom of religion rights uh, of, of the UDV religion, which uses ayahuasca as a sacrament. and. Um, um, and it was, uh, you know, DEA and Customs intervened with the function of the church, and this, the church sued for their freedom of religion rights. They won in federal court, and appealed to the uh, the uh, Court of Appeals in Denver, won there as well, both panel and the full court. Then was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which announced its decision in 2006, essentially declaring that um, when taken within the context of religious practice, ayahuasca would be le legally allowed. So this is an enormous uh, precedent and, uh, and, and quite a surprise to me. So here, here's the same uh, uh, kind of schematic drawing that, that David showed. This is actually from a, uh, a, a drawing of the artist Kathleen Harrison. But you could see this uh, uh, mushroom shaman from uh, from rock painting or, or, or you know in caves from uh, between 7,000 to 9,000 years ago, you can see the mushroom protuberances uh, on through out the torso and the limbs and the beehive mask the, the, uh, that the presumed shaman is wearing. The significance of the beehive mask is that in the ancient world uh, there were great challenges in preserving foods and fungal material, and uh, but they found that honey was a good preservative. So that, that is believed to be the, uh, the reason for the beehive mask. But these, uh, these plants, these extraordinary plants have been used for, for many millennia by indigenous people scattered about the world. So there are well over a hundred uh, different species of plant hallucinogens have been identified. A wonderful book by Schultes and Albert Hoffman uh, on, on plant hallucinogens uh, really kind of provides tr tremendous uh, Tremendous detail. The book is called Plants of the Gods, and we, we, we and but we've learned through investigation that there the, these plant compounds have been used for religious and medicinal purpose, also with initiation rites by diverse cultures around the world, and they've had a, a profound influence on the evolution of even modern civilization. The range of effects uh, we, we know that the, it, it impacts, um, you know, uh, you, you know perception, affect, cognition, a sustained alteration of consciousness, uh, but it, 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 for the most part, clear sensorium. Uh, it does not cause frank uh, visual hallucinations. Rather, with eyes closed, it creates a visionary experience, often of thematic content, often as if it were a waking dream that tells a tale, that gives one a lesson, and often references back to what one's intention is to have this experience in the first place. When, do, when doing treatment with these compounds, I, I find it's very important to take some time going over with your patient, what is their intention for this experience? Is it to, to heal a condition? Is it to get insight? Is it to have some kind of spiritual epiphany? But get the patient to really articulate what their intention is. Uh, the, these compounds also cause synesthesia, a, a very unusual perceptual um, alteration of diff different um, uh, uh, per perceptual modalities, uh, picking up on different stimuli like um, uh, hearing color or smelling sound, 
very unusual and distinct for a, a hallucinogen experience. And these compounds also induce a, a, a sense of union uh, with others and with the natural world. I say during the time I spent in Brazil, particularly up in Manaus in, in the Amazon, I, I found that a great many of the people I, I, I got to know who were members of the UDV or the Unia Vegetal, the Ayahuasca Church, were envi also environmental activists, and some had taken that on as a uh, career. They're very, they found their work with ayahuasca had really sensitized them, not only to the beauties of nature, but to the in, in, in impending um, catastrophes that await us unless we start to intervene and protect the natural world that's all around us. Again, these experiences, similar dreams, spontaneous epiphanies, and, and sometimes psychotic states, particularly in those individuals with underlying vulnerability, generally preservation of orientation, memory, and ego identity. And, and, and the significance of set and setting cannot be uh, overestimated. Mental set is an individual. Who is that individual? What is his psychological makeup? What, what are his, his or hers psychological vulnerabilities? What are their expectations? What are their intentions? The setting is where you're taking it, who you're taking it with, how protected is it, how safe is it, um, and, uh, and and how adept, how skilled are, are the facilitators. And I'm a big believer that these compounds are uh, too unpredictable to uh, for most people to take on just on their own, that there should be someone providing some level of facilitation, someone who is not altered, who could address situations like, Someone is knocking at the door. How, how does one deal with that? So I, I so set and setting though are critical uh, 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 pre predictors of outcome. Uh, Lester Grinspoon, a uh, a, a, a very well known uh, psychiatrist at Harvard for many years, uh, published a very important book. Came out in 1980, Psychedelic Drugs Reconsidered. He reviewed the the experience of the field until then, uh, you know, keep in mind, uh, hallucinogens came on the scene in the in the 50s, became all the rage in the 60s, both in psychiatry, thought to be the cutting edge, as well as the general culture, but but uh, were, were studies were shut down in the early 70s. Uh, Grinspoon reviewed the 15 years of most active uh, research and, uh, and identified that upwards of 40,000 patients had been treated with hallucinogens in the 50s and 60s and uh, and and, and their experiences contributed to over a thousand clinical papers so um, looking at some of the treatment applications uh, w w one of the most impressive applications was the treatment of individuals with uh, severe alcohol abuse disorder one of the hardest c conditions uh, in, in medicine psychiatry to treat that was the case back in the 50s that's the case e even today there's certainly a need for more effective treatments uh, of alcoholics and starting with osmond in the late 50s there was a strong indication of uh, therapeutic efficacy even with a one uh session treatment with with a uh, hallucinogen osmond also was the first to identify that individuals who during the course of what was often just a, a one treatment, a, a one session treatment, but who during the course of those many hours had a powerful mystical level experience or, or, or religious experience or psycho, a, a spiritual epiphany, that these were the individuals who were most likely to establish and maintain over the follow up period uh, sustained uh, sobriety. So uh, very, very important. And Stan Groff in the late 60s, early 70s, corroborated that um also other other areas chronic ptsd we know with mdma in the modern era uh michael mithofer uh, wor working with uh, the organization maps has uh, uh presented some very compelling data on the efficacy of mdma in the treatment of chronic refractory ptsd obsessive compulsive disorder in the early 2000s francisco moreno a uh a, a psychiatrist at University of Arizona published a, a, um, a ca, ca, kind of a proof of concept study finding that there was a, a signal for um, uh, effective treatment of OCD. There were some studies back in the 60s, particularly in Denmark, that also, also uh, 
uh, observed positive outcomes with some severe incapacitated OCD patients. We also had antisocial behavior. Um, there was the famous uh, uh, prison study of O'Leary and Ralph Metzner back in the early 60s, which had some methodological flaws, but also a more modern uh, effort at Al University of Alabama, Peter Hendricks, looking at uh, uh, records of, of the prison population in Alabama and finding that those individuals who had a prior experience taking a psychedelic, even, even if only on one occasion prior to their being incarcerated, that they were far more likely not to relapse and uh, go back to prison. So there was a much, uh, there's a dis distinct difference in recidivism rates that uh, prior use of psychedelics appeared to contribute to uh, improved behavior and uh, of individuals. Autism, there are a number of studies of um, you know, subpar methodologies, working with children to create some ethical issues. But uh, that being said, we work with MDMA treating a population of young adults with uh, on the autism, high functioning on the autism spectrum with um, uh, uh, severe social anxiety. And we got a very strong signal of, of efficacy. And then finally, I'll spend a little more time on this uh, area, the treatment of individuals approaching the end of life with advanced stage medical illness who are overwhelmed with existential angst, anxiety, demoralization. Um, some wonderful work was done demonstrating that a psychedelic treatment model may be a very effective uh, uh, treatment, uh, starting with Eric Cass, of the University of Chicago in the early 60s, extending to uh, Gary Fisher and Sidney Cohen, uh, both at UCLA, and, um, and then Walter Pankey, a, um, a, a, a uh, psychiatrist at Harvard who had a doctorate in uh, theology from the Harvard School of Divinity, did some you know groundbreaking work in this area and was followed up by his colleague at the University of Maryland, Stanislav Grof who was a very, very accomplished and seasoned researcher in this area. But they, they published some very um, moving studies and books on the use of a psychedelic model for uh, individuals approaching the end of life. Uh, I found very moving and really did a lot to inspire me to not only eventually study psychedelics, but go into psychiatry in the first place. So, um, Let's see. So looking at some other studies, uh, phase one studies. So all research was shut down by the late 60s, early 70s and the early 90s. Uh, our group at Harbor and a couple of other groups elsewhere got phase one research off the ground. Rick Strausman at New Mexico, looking at the range of effects of uh, uh, intravenous dimethyltryptamine. We, we had a, uh, a, a kind of a dose finding study with MDMA at Harbor UCLA. Uh, Deborah Mash at, at uh, University of Miami looked at the range of effects, uh, physiological, psychological effects of Ibogaine, and then we did our work um, down in, uh, in, in Brazil, first in Manaus, looking at adult subjects, uh, and, and collaborated here with Dennis McKenna and J.C. Calloway, and then uh, uh, about, you know, several years later, in uh, look, working in the uh, southern ur urban cities of Brasilia, Campinas, Sao Paulo. My main collaborator there is uh, Mar Marlena Dopkin de Rios. Uh, we, we, we worked up uh, adolescents who, uh, who were from families that belonged to the UDV Syncretic Ayahuasca Church and who had uh, permission from the government to participate in family ceremonies with parents and grandparents where ayahuasca was utilized as a psychoactive sacrament. A very important paper and body of work coming out of Johns Hopkins led by Roland Griffiths. Uh, also in this work is Bill Richards, one of the, uh, maybe one of the most seasoned researchers in the field. Bill worked with Stan Groff starting in the mid sixties in Maryland and still working at Hopkins with Roland some, um, you know, six, some, six, you know, over 50 years later. But, uh, but Roland's very interested in the, um, the degree to which uh, psychedelics can facilitate mystical level experiences. And he was able to successfully show that people and could predictably encounter 
uh, spiritual, psycho-spiritual epiphanies, uh, which uh, fit the um, criteria for mystical experience. And this is important to know that one can, and it's and it was, if you look back at some of the early work of Graf and Osman, you see that uh, having a mystical experience seemed to be predictive of a positive therapeutic outcome, even regardless of what the underlying condition was. So Roland Griffith's work demonstrating that you under optimal conditions you can reliably induce a powerful mystical level experience which is predictive of a of a positive therapeutic outcome i think is very important as this field moves forward so a peak experience uh, developed by walt pankey and bill richards is very really a mystical experience a sense of sense of unity and oneness transcendence time and space a very powerful positive mood a sense of awe and reverence uh powerful sense of meaning and, and insight one has ineffability very difficult to articulate to put into words these these experiences paradoxicality what you think your experience may not at all be what is really going on and transiency you know while you're in the throes of the experience it's as if it's an eternity it's going on forever but once it's over there's this sense of it's gone in the flash of an eye so these are some of the uh, the, the distinct experiences of uh, psychedelics uh phase two studies uh, we did a, a, a I'll talk a little bit about our data a pilot study of treating uh, individuals with advanced stage cancer related anxiety with uh, a moderate dose of psilocybin. Uh, the, uh, the FDA kind of shot down our, our first submission when we were going for a high dose said basically saying no one has looked at this compound in decades. Let's you know, start off more cautiously. And I thought that was reasonable. We did a lot of back and forth. And 0 0.2 mg per kg body weight is a uh, you know, reasonable, moderate level dose. And certainly, it, it, you know, we had no safety issues. And that may have been one of the issues. We had a more moderate dose in a couple of the other groups. And after we published, um, Steve Ross at NYU kind of basically used our protocol, which we gave to him. And he, we both used niacin placebos. Roland Griffiths, who had his own kind of uh, independent uh, methodology and, and also permission to use a higher yet dose, used an extremely low dose uh, psilocybin as, as the active placebo control. And this, you know, niacin was problematic because of the notorious niacin reaction. And after watching a couple of those with my subjects, I, I vowed off of ever using niacin again. But the low dose psilocybin model um, is problematic as well because if look if there's any merit to the to the microdose uh, approach then perhaps even dosages that are presumed to be sub threshold could be doing something so uh, there is this ongoing search for the ideal active placebo and um, I don't think we've found it just yet although I can I can share with you at the end of the talk what what we've come up with for our new study. This is our treatment room. We started off with a very drab, you know, standard hospital room. We fixed it up really nicely, kind of cocooned the patient in there with, you know, ha you know, fabrics and wall hangings and flowers and all sorts of stuff. Um, there, subjects are provided with several preparatory psychotherapy sessions after being screened in. We utilize a double blind placebo control crossover methodology. We our active placebo was uh, niacin. We worked in our GCRC setting, which unfortunately, the, 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 it's, it's an NIH uh, funding process that is no longer available. And we had uh, several follow-up eval and integrative sessions. Uh, we, we treated 12 subjects. Uh, we had 13 are listed here because number eight, uh, drop, a few days before her scheduled first session dropped out. So, uh, but curiously, we had 11 female subjects, only one male. Uh, I'm not sure why that was the case. Ages range from mid 30s to late 50s. We had four people with um, uh, metastatic breast cancer, three with colon and colorectal cancer, uh, two with ovarian cancer, and one each with multiple myeloma, salivary gland cancer, and peritoneal cancer. Um, you can see the various degrees that they had survived to date. All, all subjects uh, passed within a couple of years of participation in the study. Uh, we published in the Archives of General Psychiatry in 2000, 
11 uh, considered that point the number one impact journal in the field so we felt this was a kind of a validation by uh, by the field that we were ready once again to take on what had been kind of taboo for many decades you know when i was in medical school and i brought up the topic of uh, would it be interesting to go back and study uh, hallucinogens I, I i found out very quickly that that was not a uh, an acceptable topic for uh, for, 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 you know, for, in, 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 within medicine, but by by the uh, 21st century, I think we are at that place where the field is opening up again, and uh, and this is may, maybe first manifested by being able to get published in a high ranked journal, but also if you can see, you know, identify the, the, the tremendous number of studies that are are being conducted now. But back back to our psilocybin study with individual to advanced stage cancer, you can see physiologically very well tolerated very minimal uh, jump in heart rate, um, systolic blood pressure, no, no, no real significant differences uh, after the drug is administered. Oh, I want to see something. You see a dias diastolic blood pressure. Um, the, uh, you know, the diastolic only went up to the high 70s, and uh, that's not, 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 would not evoke any concern. Looking at depression ratings, the Beck scale, uh, looking at a kind of a co contrast between the two different groups, everyone is blinded to, for two weeks after um, treatment. You see no 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 differences. Uh, but if you look at uh, when you cum all the findings, everyone acted as their own control. Should mention that. So you were randomized either into receiving psilocybin first or receiving a placebo first. Everyone is blinded. A month later, you come back for your second session, and whatever condition you did not get the first time, you get the second time, and only the research pharmacist kind of knew exactly what people were getting. But here you could see that uh, a sustained improvement of mood that, that extended for, uh, for the six-month follow-up period. Looking at anxiety, looking at state trait anxiety inventory, state anxiety is how anxious do you feel in the moment, no, no short or longer term differences. But if you look at trade anxiety, like how anxious would you assess you've been over the last couple of weeks, you see that whereas there's no difference between the two groups um, after the first couple of weeks, after everyone gets treated, again, a sustained drop in trade anxiety that even reached uh, statistically significant proportions at a couple of points, which given the modest end we had was uh, it's kind of surprising, but also gratifying to see it fit our, our hypothesis going in. Uh, Steve Ross uh, and Tony Bassis at NYU uh, did a very similar study published in the Journal of Psychopharmacology. Um, they, they, they had a higher dosage uh, that they were allowed to use. They got even more uh, impressive results. And Hopkins, a higher dosage yet. I think there were some increased safety issues, but they had greater efficacy. And I think the beauty of this treatment isn't that simply that someone feels good the day of treatment or the day after or the day after that, but that the improved mood and the amelioration of anxiety can sustain over many, many months. Here, six month follow ups, still finding very, very positive uh, reports. Um, other phase two studies at NYU and UNM, Michael Bogenschutz recently uh, published on his treatment of alcohol abuse disorder, getting a good outcome uh, in sync with Groff's early work and Osmond's early work back in the 60s and 50s. Uh, Peter Hendricks at Alabama has treated uh, low SEC a minority cocaine and crack addicts with, with good outcome. A very interesting study at Hopkins by Matt Johnson, uh, an application I never thought of, uh, but you know, he came up with it, smoking cessation, finding uh, very favorable results. And recently, um, uh, NIDA has uh, funded a uh, extension of, uh, of, of the smoking cessation study. And this is the first time NIDA has actually uh, uh, funded, provide funding for a psychedelic treatment study. And there's been some examination of uh, of uh, unipolar depression, starting off at with in England with the Imperial College London group. Dr. Grove, I just want to give us some time for Q and A. So when you yes, okay, I'll fly. And I, and I know you have to also bounce that too. I got so. another talk I got to give. So um, yeah, so yeah, big big business is getting involved. FDA has given breakthrough therapy status for psilocybin and MDMA. Conventional paradigm: we give drugs daily for weeks, months, years to ameliorate or presume brain state. 
um, insider attitude, not not thought to be significant. But the psychedelic paradigm, this would represent a big paradigm shift, where a drug need be only administered once or on a handful of occasions, separated out in, in time, loosens defenses, facilitates insight. The mystical experience is certainly may, may be a predictor of positive outcome, but you need very careful monitoring and supportive psychotherapy. This book just kind of really blew the lid off the culture and uh, I think great uh, interest surged after his publication, Michael Pollan's book. You, you've even seen in the last few years initiatives in several states, Denver, Oakland, Santa Cruz, and a couple of states, I mean cities and then states, Colorado and uh, Oregon have uh, decriminalized moving to legalization and Oregon and Colorado are coming up with uh, models for utilization of mushrooms and treatment. So decriminalized now what a lot of challenges await. And I think these groups that have pushed for decriminalization need to um, uh, address public education to make sure individuals uh, fully understood the sa safety uh, parameters. Uh, this is a, just a poster from FDA. They, they've been very good about really getting on board and they invited a bunch of us in the field to come to, to their headquarters in Silver Spring to talk about psychedelics and the research we've conducted. And, uh, and they've taken this to heart and they, they've been very, uh, I, I think all in all, you know, they're careful, but they're also supportive and um, they're allowing uh, well thought out studies with good safety parameters to, to move forward. Um, also, philanthropic uh, donations uh, have been uh, extraordinary. Hopkins got upwards of $20 million to recently to start a psychedelic research center, also Mass General uh, at UCLA, and other UC schools are also uh, starting to put together their own psychedelic research uh, programs. Uh, big business is also getting involved, and one needs to, I think, uh, be very, very cautious about this. They are uh, evaluated in the billions of dollars, some of these. And, um, you know, my concern is that uh, in order to uh, maximize return on investment for their investors, they're going to have to cut costs. And my concern is it'll erode uh, safety parameters. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of my, my current study, the, the Great Existential Dilemma. Uh, antidepressants and conventional psychotherapy are of limited efficacy with individuals approaching the end of life. You can see here, these are the controlled studies that have explored uh, using a psychedelic model. Um, our, our study, we call it a pragmatic trial of psilocybin treatment and palliative care. We're going to partner up with palliative practitioners. We utilize a manual driven meaning and purpose therapy. Uh, from a uh, psychologist in Australia, David Kassane. Uh, so we're taking an existential psychotherapy approach. A moderate, we're using a moderate, uh, moderate high dose uh, psilocybin, and we're primarily looking at uh, demoralization, uh, secondary variables to be depression, anxiety, quality of life, spirituality, and pain. We we're using a ketamine uh, oral ingested uh, uh, active uh, placebo. We feel it'll cause, and, you know, ketamine is already being used with these these patients. And we're, this is not a head-to-head -head trial. We're just trying to find a uh, an active placebo which would induce an altered state, which uh, may not make it so easy for patients to discern what they're on. Uh, we start enrollment uh, uh, hopefully at the end of the summer, and uh, and hopefully within a couple of years we'll have our data and a manuscript for some ready for submission. Final slide. These little guys are mushroom stones from from thousand a thousand years ago in Central America, and I like to think they're looking out on us, the modern uh, inheritors of of their sacred plants, and their their message is use these plants with with great respect because they have sacred qualities and they can do they could be have wondrous he, healing effects, but uh, only if one optimizes the conditions and the intentions under which they're taken. So finally, just we need to learn from the lessons of the past, both the preceding generation of uh, researchers in the 50s and 60s, but also the indigenous people who are the true experts in this area. And maybe the important thing is that in order for this field to 
to maintain and to move forward in a, in, in a healthy way. We need to optimize safety and ethical standards. There have been problems in both these regards in the past, so we really need to focus in and not, uh, not give it short shrift. We need to examine public health implications, make sure that what happened in the 60s, which was that the drugs spilled out of the research labs into the general population, particularly among kids, and became, you know, to some degree with some vulnerable individuals, uh, highly problematic. There's the issue of microdosing. Is, is it really efficacious or not? It was very exciting to read a, anecdotal cases, but so, some hard, you know, quantitative data that's coming out now in the microdose model is a little more hesitant to in, endorse its, uh, its efficacy. We need greater diversity in the field, both patients, we need more socioeconomic diversity, more, uh, more, 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 more racial diversity. We need this in, in the, uh, amongst the uh, research groups as well. We need to have more women need to have, be in positions of authority and we need uh, more people of color. Also, you know, collaborating and uh, take, taking lead roles. Uh, the regulatory obstacles, I, honestly, I've done this research now for 30 years. It's manageable as long as you're willing to, you know, to engage in dialogue. I find the regulatory agencies very collegial, and sometimes they give us very good advice, which improves the quality of our, our protocols. Funding options, one really needs to look at this very seriously. You know, I, I, ideally, the government would fund these studies, but those are few and far between. Philanthropy would be next uh, of import, but uh, you, you can't always count on philanthropy. It really depends on the, the state of the economy. And a for-profit, the for-profit businesses jumping into this field uh, concerns me, concerns others. There's been some controversy over patents that have been submitted that are, seems somewhat specious. So uh, yeah, and then the expanded access issue. So I've, I've, that that's it for my talk with um uh, a few some a little time left. thank you very much Great. okay um I'll if everybody can turn, yeah and if everybody can turn on their camera that'd be terrific thank you for a wonderful presentation really appreciated the evidence and some of the trial design methods rigor and considerations um it's really important for our, our audience our communities to be thinking about that as well as some of the history like we talked about before we have two, uh, three questions. Um, let me get to them in the Q&A. So Sarah Gorbin asks for uh, Dr. Connor, are you familiar with a form of meditation? Uh, for example, uh, uh, let's see, Vipassana compared to the transcendental, compared to the mindfulness, influences the comparative effects with psilocybin or other psychedelics, such as uh, different neuroimaging results. It's kind of a big question. We don't. We only have nine minutes before we. Yeah, answer. I'll give a you know just a brief brief answer to that, and um, there's also this second question she put in there about okay, neuroimaging and whether brain activation findings tend to be symmetrical or asymmetrical. Um, you know, the main thing is there's really only a handful of studies that have directly compared, contrasted in you know the same population. Um, the effects of meditation and psychedelics. And um, two of the larger have been run by uh, Roland Griffiths and his uh, group at Johns Hopkins. Um, uh, one was just you know, comparing uh, a, a, a series of psychedelic uh, therapy sessions over time with their kind of normal treatment as usual, kind of supportive care versus uh, an enhanced um, kind of spiritual practice group that included some meditation instruction of a kind of mantra-based uh, practice, um, so-called passage meditation uh, by Eknath Swaran. And, um, you know, that showed the expected, uh, you know, hypothesized effect that some of the uh, benefits, you know, subjective benefits and even benefits as rated by significant others in people's lives in the group that went through the kind of spiritual support uh, intervention instead of just the psychedelic uh, assisted therapy uh, treatment as usual in their in their protocol uh, intervention, um, there were greater greater benefits and those benefits seem to accrue with time. You know, after six months uh, after the last session, those benefits were even greater comparing the two different groups. 
um, no radically different changes, but that doesn't say much about the specifics of which practice might be, you know, most beneficial. And if it's even similar from one person to another um, in general, you know, people tend to gravitate towards different practices because it feels good for them and or just, you know, some kind of look of the draw. Um, the one kind of piece of harder evidence that they've, uh, they don't, they haven't published yet, but I've seen the, the data is related to, I think, an important uh, distinction that uh, in general, uh, the more open awareness forms of uh, meditative practice, Vipassana or non-dual type practices um, are uh, more easily uh, kind of consonant with the um, uh, acute effects of psychedelics. People will rate that their experience with those practices is both easier and a little bit more powerful in terms of the internal state of really being in a deep meditative state whereas the more focused types of practices that involve mantra or, or you know focusing just on the breath there's a, a a tendency for the effect of uh psilocybin to be such that you know you, you're not able to channelize the attention quite as effectively so while the effect may still have some positive ex experience to it it also feels a little like you're kind of uh pushing against the um you know the the limitations of the attentional expansion that the psychedelic is uh encouraging versus this kind of channelizing of attention that the practice is focused on so th that's the main uh kind of hard evidence in looking at the impact mm -hmm. of two different practices that's that's that i'm aware of thank you good uh good question there's so many great questions that we have limited time so i kind of want to ask something generically so that people can all all three of you can chime in a little bit before we run out and so there are questions about you know big industry involvement and how do we take these types of disruptive ideas and tools and put them into play in the medical healthcare system um how do we uh move these ideas where we feel there's been traditions and decades and of, of research that support them and more rigorous trials coming out. You know, where, what, what's the place on the treatment shelf and how do we impact the environments in which we work to actually move these more disruptive interventions forward? Or I might like to say more innovative, right? Um, uh, interventions forward with our patients. And we can kind of go around giving everybody just a couple of minutes before we have to wrap up to address that. You want to go uh, first, Dr. Grove? I see you sure. positioning. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, that that's really the question right now. We're starting to get a sense that uh, the, the, these drugs in optimal circumstances can be of enormous help. We also know that some people have gone off the rails and have sustained damage. Um, so I, I think we do need to kind of, focus in hard on safety parameters. For instance, I actually, I thought you were gonna ask a question about microdosing. I was, what I was gonna say there is, yeah. you know, so far the evidence is, is limited for efficacy, but there's also a concern that, um, you know, there, there are, the, the hallucinogens are active, not just at 5-HT2A receptors, but also 5-HT2B as, as well as others. And the 5-HT2B receptors um, all, all have a role in maintaining a functional integrity of cardiac valves. So there's a concern of frequent pulsing with the mm -hmm. microdose model. Could we be creating um, cardiac issues, well, are, are we, particularly individuals who are already predisposed to serious arrhythmias. So I say moving forward, we need to really establish a very, very strong foundation where we have a good grasp on safety parameters, know how to properly screen, know how to properly uh, protect people. Uh, there's also the issue of ethics that individuals need to abide by a strong, you know, facilitated, need to abide by a strong code of ethics. And there have been some concerns in this realm as well. So I think this is where the focus needs to be. You also raise, a, I think, a, an important issue that often gets overlooked, which is, you know, we may have discovered, we may have isolated alkaloids in the lab, but we didn't, uh, we're not the first to understand these compounds and to utilize them for salutary purpose. These were the, the ancient peoples, the indigenous peoples, so, so some of the most marginalized people in the modern world. And we, we have sacred knowledge 
that they at great risk to in the past to, to lives of and 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 existence of communities the lives of the people because they were brutally persecuted when using these plants they 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 held these secrets really for us to take are we going to appropriate them and just profit off them as is the tendency in in mm -hmm. our modern world or or do we understand there's a need to to bring in marginalized peoples particularly people from indigenous communities where there's a tradition and um and create some kind of um you know process where, where, whereby they, they they get to partake of some of the positive gain you know mm -hmm. wh whether it's th th participating in the therapeutic context or receiving some kind of of payment or or land grants or or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. we, we can't forget about the indigenous people as uh, as is too often the case I appreciate that. It's a very valuable point and creating access and inclusion, right? Is what you're talking about, so that it it circles back to tradition and the ancestries and where rightfully sat to begin with. And that, you know, we, we're a tool in some sense to kind of try to advance the science and the application and to work collaboratively to bring this to our communities for health, right? For health and spirit. And I think that's kind of, that's the driving force. So I'd like to hear from uh, Dr. Presti. Is there something you'd like to add or comment on? Uh, thank you. Yeah. I, well, I very much agree with what Charlie Grove just said and, um, uh, and believe that, I mean, we have this tendency in our uh, our model of reality that if we understand something scientifically that we have some degree of control over that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I believe uh, actually that the psychedelics are going to shake us up a little bit around that uh, and they will force us to honor uh, a larger perspective on reality. And I think the larger perspective on reality, it not only honors the indigenous origins of many of these materials because <clears throat> that tends to be somewhat descriptive of the worldview that many cultures hold mm -hmm. uh, about some kind of deeply interconnective relationship between who we are as conscious living beings and the rest of the biosphere. And so I think we're going to be pushed in that direction, which I believe will be a good thing mm -hmm. uh, for us. Uh, and that uh, I, I see this as a real opportunity and of course, the devil is in the details around the how 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 slowly or quickly you might be able to move kind of the medical paradigm, but that this will force us to expand our medical paradigm around mental health. And this yeah. is really an old conversation. I mean, this is not dissimilar to a conversations mm -hmm. that Thomas says and Artie Lang had in psychiatry, you know, 60 years ago. Yes. Uh, but psychedelics take that conversation to another level. And I think we're only at the beginning of that right now. And one more thing I'd like to stress the importance of given that the this given uh, uh, Ray Khan's presence here is that the interaction of the use of these powerful medicines with contemplative practice and with contemplative community in a way to really maintain whatever gains one may have had during that exper experience, I believe is key to mm -hmm. really uh, uh, to really making them as valuable as they potentially can be. That's a wonderful point. And uh, Dr. Khan, would you like to add to that before we wrap up? I think that that uh, <laughs> pointing <laughs> that direction, you know, is really, uh, it, it's really all that needs to be done at this point. Um, and I know okay. that there are those, including myself in the field, who are trying to systematically start exploring that. Mm -hmm. And I, I really do feel it will be helpful in terms of its um, kind of integrated impact in, uh, in people's lives as well as community building. Right. I love the emphasis on, um, on uh, it, it, the integrative aspects of the complementary nature of psilocybin in this case, or psychedelics, where we're talking about, it's not the panacea, but it's something that can complement or work alongside with contemplative practices or other types of therapies for the health and the wellness of our patients, the families, our communities, ourselves, right? I think that's a really big emphasis and very important sort of underscore. And I think we can, we can land on that. I want to, you are all pioneers of 
ancestral work, right? I mean, in the sense that it, it's sort of a, a paradox to say that, but it's true that you're continuing on in an area that has been around for a very long time and trying to make it relevant to our current society in, again, the 21st century. So uh, reinvigorating, performing some CPR on practices that happened in the 60s and the 50s. And uh, I, I take my hat off to all of you as pioneers in this space. And we're so happy um, with uh, Dr. Khan and myself to collaborate uh, between the Center of Biophilus Science as well as the Institute for Integrative Health and Wellness to bring you here and to have this wonderful presentation. So thank you all very much today. And for our audience and our community who hung in there for two hours, appreciate that. And thank you for your time. And you can contact us if you have questions. And the recording of this will be on both the CMS and the IIHW websites for you to access if you want to look at it or send it off to your colleagues and friends. So I hope everybody has a wonderful day. And thank you so much for tuning in and for your uh, illuminating discussions today. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right. Bye-bye. Awesome. There you are. I think they stopped recording. Oh, not yet. The uh, We could have.